Okay, so the battle's done. You've you've played through. It was quite a quick and brutal fight. Yeah, quick and brutal is a good description of Bill Hooks. <laughs> that works. Yeah. I mean, this isn't your first uh, fight either. You guys probably oh, no. have played each other more than anyone. Yeah, but there's the, you can never predict what's going to happen in this no. game. It's so uh, you don't get you don't get too upset about losing, do you? I think our first recorded battle was May two thousand and nineteen. Yeah, something like that. That's how long it's been going on, and mm. th they're they're always different, always, and you cannot, as Andy says, predict. The dice can throw up some really odd results. And the cards as well. And the card sequence, yeah. which makes you you on edge as a commander because you know if your card comes up in the right sequence, you've, you're going to win the battle. And if it doesn't, you're in trouble. <laughs> so the thing to do is get, not to get too upset if you lose. You just have another, other, have another game. Yes. Yeah. Might well go the other way. Yeah, it does seem to be that kind of game where you can get a few games in in the evening. Yeah. It's, it's not too serious. Yeah. It's yeah. just really about fun yeah. and cinematic yeah. kind yes. of combat. That's, yeah. right. That's right. It's very playable. And then it, it's made me go away and, and read about the War of the Roses as well. So you look at the history. And it, it was fairly brutal from what I've read. I mean, in terms of like your history together playing, can we hear a little bit about how you came in on the project and your playtesting and all that kind of thing. The history is quite interesting for me because um, I, I run Arcane Scenery and Models and I noticed that somebody in my hometown or village of Bingham had ordered a set of figures and I thought I'll deliver them. So I knocked on <laughs> Andy's door and said I've got your figures and uh, I think it's interesting with war gamers, they're not always um, forthcoming at saying what they do, but we, I had a conversation with Andy and he said, actually I've got loads of war game figures, well, come and have a look. Come and have a look. <laughs> Name me an army and I've got it, and, and that was it, we started playing war games then, so yeah. we've been playing for some time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very much, a, it's just very much a, a very, very small group of friends really. Mm. War games is a funny sort of hobby, a lot of, people, a lot of people like going to clubs, I'm one of those people that I would... I choose my company very, very carefully, and so it, it, it's the it's the it's the company is, is is like most male hobbies. It's it's the company and the banter that's as important as what it is you're actually doing. So uh, um, we're a, we're a, we're a small but select select band. Yes, uh, Andy's the, an inherent rules tinkler. Yeah. His own words, not yeah. mine. And so we were we we'd been playing various games, mainly Napoleonic, and we wanted to change. And, and we, I, th I think it just came out of the air. What about War of the Roses? And Andy said, oh, I've got a rule set. I think I can adapt. Yeah, we we've, been, we've been using a sort of big, big, big skirmish, small battle rule set that had evolved from, uh, it evolved from the um, sharp practice by the, by the two fat lardies several years before. And uh, there were things we liked in it. There were things we wanted to change. So I fiddled around with that a bit. And we've got a a sort of simplified version of that. So I thought, well, I'll just fiddle around with this a bit more, but it didn't really work. So we had to, although we kept the card sequence, although I fiddled around with that, um, it's more or less uh, a clean a clean start. What you have to say is that very few war games rules or mechanisms come from thin air. They all date back to something. There are elements in Bill Hooks that I can direct, trace directly back to H.G. Wells and uh, Donald Featherstone. Um, so, in a bit like in the Wars of the Roses, more or less everybody was, was some sort of descendant of Edward III in this. This is a descendant of all sorts of war games, greats that have gone before. So, um, there's a little bit of originality in there, but there's a lot, also a lot of uh, tribute rules, shall we say. One of the, the fun parts of the game for me is the ability to have your own commanders. So, you're not refighting Towton or a historical battle every game. And what we found is that characters develop their own personality. It's bizarre how it happens, but the dice do it for you. And so, I mean, the, the joke is that I, I play with Harry Hotspur, Sir Eric Diehard and Sir Daniel Rose, who uh, people can figure out who the army is based on. Andy's is based on his hometown. But the characters take on their own life. And I think I'd encourage people who take up this um, to, to also figure out their own retinues. And, and they, they will take their own life and the series of games becomes more important. And you'll find that Sir Daniel Rose often ends up injured. <laughs> and Sir Eric Die Hard bravely holds the centre and Harry Hotspur does what Harry Hotspur does. And it, it, it's strange how it does it. Do you think you might be influencing that just a little bit based on your own personal knowledge? Uh, of course it's possible, of course it's possible. But it, 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 as I say, it adds to the fun. Yeah.
But in more than more than most games, uh, the dice goddess is an absolute bitch in, in Bill Hooks. <laughs> she really is. You can't <laughs> put any trust in her. One thing I would say is whenever you roll dice for um, roll dice for a, a cannon fire, always say a silent prayer to Saint Barbara, the patron saint of gunners. Yes, that stops you rolling once. It, it, so, the, so my <laughs> priest tells me anyway. Yeah. The artillery is a good case in point. You're rolling six dice, oh. and you can you can have results where you'll get three or four casualties, and the the, the other person will be crying. This is not fair. This is yeah. not fair. Equally, we found turn after turn where the cannons refused to hit anything, and then blown up, and then blown up. Yeah. <laughs> so. How much tinkering does something like that take through the playtesting process? Endless, <laughs> endless. Um, the great thing about uh, doing a document on Word is you can see how much time, how much of your life you've wasted on it. I'm well into three figures of hours on tempering, t tinkering with this thing. Okay, so I mean, if you were to pick out the different unit types and stuff, would you say that there's one that really has remained fairly similar throughout, and there are some that have drastically changed? The core, the core, the core rules for the the, the, the key elements: bows, bills, men at arms. They're pr they're pretty consistent. We've yeah, not done much changes there. It's the exotics that you have to think about a bit more. Uh, Irish Irish skirmish in Kern are, are, are a case in point. They uh, they they always add a bit of a uh, bit of colour to the battlefield. They're very unpredictable because <laughs> they're the only skirmishers that can actually attack. Right. So if you draw the card that says you've got a hidden unit of skirmishers in a wood somewhere, you can bet your life if you put some Kern in there, they'll come out and jump on some unit's rear and put the yeah. wind up them. We had one famous game where somebody was so enraged by these Irish kern that he sent his best unit, a group of man-at-arms, and they were chasing after them like demented Cybermen, never actually catching them. And it totally distracted him from the actual real battle. It's, it's good fun. It does seem to be a game that really creates a lot of stories in that respect. Yes. And I mean, yeah. like the skirmishes in the game that you guys just played, possibly didn't play to their usual kind of role. It was partly yeah, to do with the I setup. I they were just going through the motions. Yes. Yeah. 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 They, they look to me as though they're from the same region of Burgundy. Yeah, they probably were. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the light cavalry, see, light cavalry are useful because they move fast and they can move a long way, but if they get in range of archers, they can be shot to pieces very, very, very quickly. I was lucky there. It all depended on the turn order that the cards come up. Actually, that was one of the innovation that you've brought in that we didn't see, that we allowed Light Horse to dismount into a band of skirmishers, yes. either crossbowmen or archers. Yeah, if they're and equipped that way. Yeah, and they, Steve's figures are, of course. That, that, yeah, Pete yeah. Harris, actually. But they, yeah. they, um, they then uh, become a band of six skirmishers with two horse holders. Mm. Uh, and so that, that was quite an interesting development mm. that gave you something else you could do with light horse. Mm. Um, so yes, it, it, uh, it has evolved. And I think more in the game mechanics, we had some very strange results earlier on and, and lots of debates. You still about some strange results. <laughs> yeah, no. Lots of debates about what's fair and what's not fair. Mm. And, and sometimes units becoming too powerful. But I think it's settled down. Yeah. And uh, there's enough there. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no one type of troops that are all powerful on this. Uh, the fully armoured stuff can be, but if you start whittling it down, like, like that, that artillery was, and uh, uh, with knights as well, you know, they can be vulnerable while they're, while, while they're still coming into the charge. Yeah. Uh, and you have to put something in their way, because if you don't put something in their way, they're going to go straight through you. Um, hence the hidden ditch or wall in this case. But uh, that's why archers carry stakes. You put some stakes in front of them. Your cavalry is not going to charge through. It's going to get the mess, and you can shoot it to pieces. I mean, is uh, is the large skirmish kind of approach something that's quite new to you in terms of game design? It seems to be one that's a lot more popular it, recently. It is. It is for me because, I, as I said, I've been doing this for fifty years or so. And the, back in the day, the way to do war games was to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of badly painted figures because nobody had any more time to, to do that. But increasingly, you have a smaller number of very well painted figures. Um, but uh, unless you're exceptionally dedicated, uh, be unmarried and don't have any children, um, <laughs> you, you have to spend too much of your life doing that to get big armies. So smaller armies are good because you can s with Bill Hooks you can start off with, you know, I say eighty to hundred figures a side, and then of course people will ex always want to buy build extra units. But you don't have to devote too much of your life. Uh, into uh, getting going, especially if it's a project between two or three, uh, two or three friends, you can find your 
pretty well into this very quickly. I think some of the interesting games we've had is where we've had four players, yeah. so two players aside, yeah. because all the cards are in the pack, you know that you're, you're going to get a go and the units activate at different times. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, does, that does make a, another dimension and it also, to the game. And it also seems to work in, in you know, <coughs> one, one ward will be shaping up against another ward, another one will be shaping up, and you really lose track of what's going on at the other end of the, on the, yes. other end of the battlefield. You concentrate just on what's happening there, and then all of a sudden you'll find there's a flank attack coming in because he's finishing <laughs> yeah. it. But uh, that, 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 that's, that's the way it works. Is that more of a happy accident than something you initially tried well, to you, work you into can the never, game? You can never tell with these things. It's, it's sometimes you can write a set of rules and you can spend w days and weeks on it and it never really works. This is just one of those that somehow just works better than I ever thought it would. And uh, people are starting to see subtleties in it that even I didn't realise were there, but actually they're, they're, they're probably they are. Are they happy accidents or are they a result of uh, uh, inherently good rules writing? I'll leave that to the... Uh, to the players of the game to decide. Years of experience, well, let's say. Be, yeah. years, years, years of uh, crying in the wilderness. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you this this uh, this little anecdote because it, it was the thing that really because I've been writing rules for fifty years, and back in the eighties or nineties, I used to publish quite frequently in um, in magazines. In fact, I had a set of rules published in issue one of War Games Illustrated, and we're now on three nine four. Is it three nine four? So there you go. Um, but for the last 20 years or so, I've just been writing things for people to use in amongst, amongst my friends, and I haven't really published anything. But I was at a show last year and putting on a game with my friend Mark, who runs um, Jack Lex Miniatures, and my brother Ian. And like you do, I'd wandered away from the table. It was a demo game. And uh, somebody had come up and said to my brother, oh, geez, this is an interesting game. Whose rules are you doing? He said, oh, well, they're, 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 they're by my brother, Andy Cullen. He said, Andy Cullen, I thought he was dead. <laughs> So I thought, you know, I really ought to get myself out there again. Uh, and so this is a result, really. And I won't find any wood to touch, but I'm telling that story. But anyway, that's what prompted it, really. And it was Steve's yeah. suggestion that I, I try and uh, uh, push the idea at uh, Dan. And he picked it up, uh, picked it up with enthusiasm, which yeah. I'm very pleased to see. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly seems to have worked out well. Did you expect it to get quite this popular, Steve? Yes. <laughs> I'd, after we've been playing it for six months, I found it very, very engaging. And I just thought, of all the other games I'd played, this was as good, if not better, than most. It was, it was very easy to pick up. There aren't too many complicated rules in it. The number of times we're playing a game and you have to stop the game to figure out what the correct response to a rules query we're is. Doing a bit of that there. We were. Yeah. But it, it, it um, on, when we've been playing this regularly, it just didn't happen. It plays naturally, and uh, and, it, and as I say, it, we, I've never touched wood. I've never had a bad game. It's always been good fun, win or lose. Um, so yeah, and I've had some very interesting games against against people. So so now I, was, I, th I thought it would would be a success, I was always convinced, so. Cool. I suppose there's one caveat. I think if you're a very, very serious war gamer and want to somehow reflect every single nuance that you believed happened, because let's face it, we don't know what happened in the War of the Roses by and large, um, and you like sort of games with lots of tables and complexity, you may find this not to your liking. But if you want to have an enjoyable game with your friends that's going to last uh, an hour and a half of playing and an hour and a half arguing about who won afterwards <laughs> over a drink, then uh, you, c you won't go wrong with this. One last thing we ought to show is that uh, one of the possibilities when we had this uh, was that uh, if two commanders in chief end oh, up yes. uh, uh, in, engaged in combat, um, they can challenge each other to a duel. And uh, Bill has a, has a unique mechanism of this. We do genuine hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And the hand-to-hand -hand fighting is done by you. Do a duel by fighting three rounds of rock, scissors, paper. So let's do that. Okay. One, two, three. Ooh. <laughs> one, two, three. Ooh. One to you. Ah, one nil. <laughs> one nil. Lord Callum wins the match. <laughs> it's only right, really, that the creator yeah. <laughs> would uh, emerge triumphant. Yeah. Well, I Brilliant. can't think of a better way to finish things up than that <laughs> high drama. So... Uh, Thank you very much, both of you, for coming down and uh, playing a game. Good stuff.